introduce our chair today and then I'll leave it to him to do everything else. So the chair is sitting in the middle there, Professor Harry Spider, uh, well known uh, to this foundation because he's done a fair amount of work in Japan uh, as well as in a lot of other places. Um, so he's currently head of the School of Social Sciences and Professor of Communities and Public Policy at Birmingham City University. Uh, and before that he was uh, Director of Research Development and Professor of Community Cohesion at the Centre for Trust, Peace and Social Relations in Coventry University. Uh, he spent a couple of years uh, fairly recently uh, at Columbia University in New York um, teaching graduate courses on race and public policy and he was nominated for the Presidential Teaching Prize there uh, in 2017. Uh, and his work, um, which obviously is of great uh, sort of political importance as well as uh, academic relevance, uh, has been quite widely featured uh, in the media. Um, I've got here The Nation, The Guardian, The Huffington Post, uh, the BBC, and so on. So uh, on that note, Harris, over to you. Thank you so much, Jason, and thank you everyone for coming uh, to uh, this event, the Spread of Hate speech, uh, looking at uh, the United States, uh, uh, the UK and uh, Japan. I'm really, really looking forward to this event, and I want to make it as participative as possible. I mean, the context of this is, is very clear, that uh, Antonio Guterres, uh, the United uh, Nations General Secretary, said after the, uh, the aftermath of the Christchurch mosque shootings in on this year in March, that hate speech is spreading like wildfire. And if you look all over the world, uh, in the United States, in Europe, in the UK, uh, I think you, the UK is still part of Europe technically, uh, may not be uh, later on this, this year, but UK, Europe and, and Japan, uh, that the rise of populism uh, and also the outriders of populism that are often found in uh, right-wing religious movements and elsewhere are uh, fermenting the fires that have existed. My question is, is this that I want to explore with my two esteemed colleagues, is that has hate speech always been there in the UK and Japan? And does it just pop up and rise up of in specific incidents? Uh, and to what extent is it linked to the, the framing of Japan and the UK as former uh, leading countries in terms of empire and the context of uh, decolonization and the scene of empire? To what extent has that created a framework for, for hate speech to uh, become rooted. So has it always been there? Does it rise up? To what extent is it linked to issues around immigration and change, uh, and also the position of both countries vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the world and, and the, world, the global economy? Um, of course, in both countries, there's also been uh, significant events uh, or recently. So the... Uh, the psychodrama in terms of Brexit in this country since the referendum in uh, 2016, uh, the challenges to Japan over the long recession that took three decades uh, from the 1991 uh, on with big shocks like uh, what happened in the nuclear power plant in Fukushima yeah. uh, uh, as well, unsettles us and unsettles people in both countries in terms of uh, their sense of belonging and identity. I think one of my colleagues uh, and, and friends described it uh, very uh, uh, elegantly. He said, the only thing about living in these times, the only security is insecurity in terms of what we've thought about in the past. And I think hate crime, the rights of hate crime, could be seen as part of that uh, process. So I'm really looking forward to uh, both uh, presentations. Um, the running order is that I'll pass on to Noyoto Higuchi in a moment and followed by Chris Allen. And then there'll be uh, a very short uh, moderated uh, discussion where I'll ask both presenters uh, some questions that emerge from your presentations. And then I'll throw it out to the audience as well, uh, of course. So be primed and ask in your, uh, your questions. I do know one or two people in the audience, so I'll be going to them directly. Uh, on that, and, and then there'll be a drinks reception at 7.30 uh, to 8. Uh, so, without further ado, I want to introduce uh, Dr. Noto Higuchi, uh, is, who is an Associate Professor of Sociology at uh, Tokishimima University, 
Uh, he studied on the graduate course in sociology department at Itoto Tsubashi University until 1999, and he's done, uh, has completed a number of recent publications, including uh, Japan's Ultra Right in 2016, uh, some work on uh, the position of Japanese Brazilians uh, in, in terms of the market, uh, and also, uh, more recently, who are the online uh, right-wingers. So, without further ado, uh, um, we're ready. Um, I'll pass it on to uh, <coughs> Dr. Higuchi. Thank you, Harris, for introducing me to all of you. And uh, I also thank you for all to come here tonight. And uh, first, I'd like to show you the short video clip because uh, it is a very ugly one, but it's very convincing to understand how the Japanese head groups are. So, you, uh,
uh, these speeches and acts were neither uh, punished nor prohibited in law. Also, uh, the Japan enacted uh, the first anti-hate speech law in 2016. But my focus today is not about uh, hate speech in general, but on the victims, uh, Koreans are victims. Because in the argument on hate speech on the Asahi newspapers, almost uh, two thirds of victims were sought as uh, Koreans. And uh, the, <coughs> word, the, word, the term uh, hate speech is very new to Japan. Because uh, it, appears, uh, it first appeared on newspaper in 2012. So my question today is that why are Koreans targeted by hate groups? For some Japanese, it is very natural because uh, they have been discriminated uh, and uh, looked down. But since the 1980s, the discrimination was weakened and uh, the Koreans were socioeconomically integrated. They, we can see we call that they are a kind of uh, model minority, like a six in the UK. So we need to look for other factors uh, other than what is it, socioeconomic discrimination. And this time, I like to refer to the works of Paul Gilroy, who was born in the UK and now living in the United States. But he has been, okay, he is a leading scholar of cultural studies who, uh, who provide good anatomy of racism racist in the United Kingdom. He says that uh, Post-colonial melancholia is lies in the cases okay, in the racism in the United Kingdom. He says that inability even to face the profound change that follows the end of the empire and consequent loss of imperial prestige. He called it a post-imperial melancholia, which is associated with the neo-traditional pathology. And uh, I thought it's also the case with Japan. So I like to consider what are the Japanese characteristics of post-colonial melancholia. This is uh, rooted, directly rooted in the post-war East Asian order. Because in, we are taught, we Japanese are taught that uh, the World War II was over in uh, August 15 of 1948, but actually the war continued in China and, uh, and uh, so the resurgence of uh, war in Korea in 2050 and 2048. This is because of the Japan's occupation by the United States and uh, what can I say? Uh, and the China and the Korea became the forefront of the Cold War in East Asia. Because Japan was not divided, but China and the uh, Korean Peninsula was divided to, into uh, communist and uh, capitalist camps. This made Japan, in a way, very uh, okay, advantageous because Japan had, Japan <coughs> restored its relation, uh, diplomatic relationship with China in 2000, I don't know, 1972 and China and, and Korea in 1965 and not yet with the North Korea, which made uh, post war Japan exempted from uh, colonial settlement because of the lack of uh, diplomatic relation. Uh, 
And when Japan became the most important youth ally in East Asia in the 1950s, the Cold War in East Asia prolonged compensation for colonization aggression. And the basic structure of East Asia is a kind of uh, harbor stock relation with the United States. So the Japan-South Korea relationship is also greatly influenced by the relation with the USA, which hindered reconciliation between Japan and its former colonies. Such uh, international conditions in East Asia influence policies towards Koreans in Japan because Uh, in normally, in the world of uh, migration studies, uh, migrants were integrated in a, basically in a dialectic relationship with a migrant visa visa host of host country. But in the case of Koreans in Japan, the relation was more complicated because the uh, relation with uh, their homeland, North Korea and South Korea, and national rising state, Japan, has greatly influenced the status of uh, Koreans in Japan. We can say, uh, we can see that uh, how the policies toward Koreans in Japan was formed. Because they were basically uh, formed in relation to Japan and the South Korea negotiation or uh, Japan's ratification to the uh, Refugee Convention or uh, UN Human Rights <coughs> Convention. But mostly the Japanese government were reluctantly from policies to integration. For example, uh, the legal status of Koreans were not solely uh, formulated by the Japanese government, but in close negotiations with South Korean government and Japan. Basically, the policies based on dialectic relationship. That means uh, host societies and uh, migrant minorities are very poor. They just, uh, what can I say, uh, permitted permanent resident status to North Koreans in 2082, and uh, uh, they granted the same status for both Koreans. Uh, so, the Japanese government had been, what can I say, uh, very ignorant to the status and rights of Koreans. But they have been, uh, they have been what is exempted from the responsibility because of the uh, worsening diplomatic relation between the South Korea and Japan or North Korea and Japan. This is a basic condition, but uh, we need to refer to the intermediating factor, which is exempted, exem exemplified by the rise of historical revisionism. Uh, when I was a graduate student, we saw the rush of policies or uh, trial for reconciliation with the uh, uh, Korean Peninsula and uh, China. But this kind of reconciliation also brought about backlash against, against uh, uh, Reconstruction with the neighboring countries. So we saw 
uh, we can also characterize in the 1990s as a decade of historical revisionism. Uh, in the 1990s, five, uh, there was a launching of diet member groups against apologies. And uh, now, current Prime Minister Abe also launched a movement to promote living textbooks. He also promoted uh, okay, say, uh, the promotion of textbooks. This is because of the shifting interest of right-wingers in Japan. Uh, in the 1980s, the interest of right-wingers in Japan were more history rather than uh, no, no, more defense and military affairs because of the uh, conflict with the Soviet Union. But the <coughs> interest in history was low. But instead, after the Cold War, the trend reversed. The history has been becoming much important than the 1980s, and we saw the peak of history-related issues in 2005. These conditions brought about a chance for nativist groups because the assertion to expel Koreans are closely related to historical revisionism. And we saw the rise of uh, Zaitokai, which is the most, what can I say, which is the biggest organization among head groups. In 2007, and its <coughs> rapid increase in 2010, but it now uh, stopped its activity, halted its activity in, since 2018. But its survivors are still active in performing paid speech. They, uh, because they remained, virtually renamed their uh, organization into a party. What is interesting for me is that the answer to the question, which country do you hate the most? And more than three quarter answered South Korea. It is interesting because uh, uh, China and North Korea are in there more hated by Japanese. But members of Zaitokai hate much more South Korea than China and North Korea. This is because of the historical revisionism that is, uh, that is uh, asserted by uh, hate groups. Because uh, hate groups set their goal as the abolishment of full special privileges, like uh, uh, Special Immigration Act in 1991, or uh, use of Japanese names, or uh, uh, provision of a special pension system, they are based on the status of Koreans as former Japanese citizens. Because uh, they were Japanese uh, under the colonial rule, but they lost Japanese nationality after the war. So this is Closely related, they are closely related to such kind of uh, status change of Koreans, but hate groups do not recognize the historical processes of the status of Koreans. So we can regard that uh, hate against Koreans is a variant of historical revisionism. This is why. I 
always tell that the, the rise of hate groups are closely related to the changing interest of right-wing establishment, including uh, the Prime Minister Abe. They are not what is it, isolated groups, like uh, more, what can you say, uh, like uh, losers of uh, economic change, but they are, what can you say, they are taking bandwagons of right of the right wing establishment. But at the same time, such hate speeches have been problematized in Japan, and uh, the registration process was rather rapid because we saw first the term hate speech in 2013 in the diet, and only it, it took only three years. That the ruling coalition, a ruling coalition, uh, enacted the anti-hate speech law, which is ex exceptionally speedy response uh, in Japan. But I have to say that uh, the anti-hate speech is law, and uh, the anti-hate speech law is far from adequate to uh, solve the problem, neither to solve the problem, nor to understand the origins of hate speech. Because uh, hate speech is not a cause, but a result of the problem. So we need to understand the cause of the problem. Otherwise, uh, anti-hate speech law can only serve as a symptomatic care. So I focus on why Koreans have been what will be the primary targets of hate groups. But uh, when the post colonial violence against Koreans as hate speech has a risk to hide the origins of the problem. And <coughs> curiously, most of the hate speech are targeted the Koreans instead of other migrants. Also, the Japan, Japanese government uh, enacted their new immigration law to introduce minor workers in last December. The, but the target of hate groups is still, uh, still Koreans because they are distinguished by other migrant groups in terms of their history as colonial citizens. So, I will return to you. So he says that racist violence provides an easy means to purify and rehomogenize the nation. Japanese hate speech more purely target Koreans, who reminds Japanese of pre-war crime or colonization, rather than migrants in general. So Japan's post-colonial melancholia is rooted in the inability, even to face a profound change that for the end of exceptional period, that exempted Japan from responsibility on past misdeeds, uh, which you can see uh, in the case of the comfort women. So the root cause of Japan's hate speech has its own history of racism. And I think the UK also have its roots in its roots, root history of racism. And uh, we like to, I like to hear from uh, Chris about your opinion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Naito, for that really interesting framing in terms of uh, 
the experience of hate speech uh, in Japan. And as I said, there are lots of many similarities around it. And what I want to do now is uh, introduce the second speaker tonight, Dr. Chris Allen, uh, who is Associate Professor at the Center for Hate Studies at the University of Leicester. Uh, for at least two decades, Chris has been at the forefront of, of research and practice around Islamophobia and religious-inspired motivated hate and far extremism in the, US, in the UK. He's widely published uh, in social media and in uh, print media and also in broadcast media in terms of these uh, subjects. And he has had uh, a number of advisory roles uh, in government, both in the UK and uh, internationally. So, Chris, uh, over to you. And you've got until 7 o'clock, and then we'll have a discussion and debate. I, I always feel as I'm much better on paper than I am in real life. Uh, so, <laughs> it's, uh, so, I, so I make my apologies now. Um, yeah, good, good evening. And thanks so much for inviting me to, to speak here this evening. Um, and 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 th thanks to uh, Anato as well. I, I think one of the things that when I was watching the video at the start was just how striking the similarities are between the UK and Japan. And I was I was looking at that and I was and I was thinking, you know, actually, if you kind of replace Korean for Muslim, you could very make some very very uh, you know clear links between the kind of movements that we were seeing there. And groups such as the English Defence League, the Infidels, Britain First, and so on. You know, the, the similarities were absolutely stark, and so you know, so it was really, really quite striking in terms of that. And if I'm honest, I wasn't, I wasn't kind of expecting that to be the case. I thought that there would be some, some quite marked differences there. So that, that was really interesting in, in terms of that. And I think that one of the things that, that maybe we'll, we'll come back to, uh, uh, Harris, you mentioned at the start about kind of talking about how things change or are things always, you know, or, or has it always been there? And I think that one of the things that we, we can talk about is the way in which those kind of ideas of the far right have become much more normalized. Mm -hmm. And through normalization, have begun to seep into the kind of center right, where the line between the center right and maybe the far right is maybe a little bit more fluid now than what it was maybe 20 years ago. So maybe we can come on to that. I, I want to, so I, know, I want to talk about something, you know, I want to kind of take it from a, a slightly different uh, perspective and look at look at hate speech in the UK, but kind of look at the kind of shades of hate speech and the shades of speech that maybe isn't necessarily hate speech or deemed to be hate speech, and the subtleties which actually kind of, you know, kind of bring about, and the point that, that uh, Naoto made was that hate speech isn't, it's not a cause, but a, but a result. And I think that we can see that as well in the UK as well. So I want to talk about that kind of complexity, and, I want, you know, and you've got 20 minutes to go and talk about that complexity, which is quite difficult. But, but you know, that's where I want to kind of take it today. So I was invited, um, I was invited last year to um, uh, speak in Germany on, um, about hate crime in the UK. And one of the first questions they said to me was, um, uh, well, the, there's a crisis in the UK around hate crime. And it wasn't until I'd kind of gone out of the UK that I thought, well, actually, yeah, you know, maybe we are in, in a state where there is a crisis. Because you know, these are just headlines from you know, sort of a very quick search. And you know, we can see uh, religious hate crimes on the rise, we're racially motivated, disabled, uh, disabledist hate crime, you know, trans, uh, sexual identity, homophobic. You know, all of these hate types of hate crimes are on the rise. And then there was, um, there was this at the weekend, the babies being racially abused in the UK as hate crimes against children recorded every hour. And you know, we, we kind of like, you know, we, we're maybe not taking this as seriously as, as what we are, so, as, as what it needs to be. And so I think that there is this kind of case where that we are, in some ways, in a sense of crisis in the UK. Now, one of the differences here is that what we, what we know is that when we come to hate crime, we have a very clear kind of, uh, a kind of framing as to what a hate crime is. So the College of Policing, um, you know, so prior to this, since around 2004, defines a hate crime as any criminal offence which is perceived by the victim or any other person as being motivated by hostility or prejudice. So if you know, I see somebody being attacked, and I think that that's being motivated by you know, the fact that they're maybe sort of, you know, maybe by their, their, their gender, by their kind of race, by their religion, by their ethnicity, by their, you know, uh, their, their disability, then I can actually report that as well as a hate crime. And so can the victim. So it's about, very much about perception. So it becomes something which becomes quite clear. We understand it. We can find it. We can see it as something which is quite tangible. And because of that, we can you know, record it. 
And, you know, in the UK we have those five modern strands, but the police and the closed police scene acknowledge that actually other strands can be used as well. So things such as homelessness, things around misogyny, for example, is one which is like kind of creating a lot of discussion at the moment. We can look at these kind of things and we can look at those characteristics and say, what is it that makes people hate somebody? And what is it that makes them actually want to, you know, commit a crime against them on that basis? Now, when we get to hate speech, we, we don't have that kind of same guidelines, you know. So we have general definitions, and here we have an expression of hatred towards another person or group of people that can find form in writing speech and so on. Now, if we look between the two, the first one is about perceptions. It could be my perception, it could be the perception of the victims, it could be a, a perception of, of an onlooker. Here, we don't, we don't have that kind of, you know, sort of that, that uh, kind of clarity which is required. So who is it actually that says this is hate speech? Who is it that actually kind of defines or, or categorizes something as hate speech? And also what we find is that we have like different statutes. So rather than any kind of legislation or kind of policy around kind of hate speech in the same way that we do with hate crime, we have a much more kind of mishmash, something which is like sort of not very clear. It's like kind of, it's kind of quite fluid, it kind of leads, it leads a lot of space for interpretation. And so we have their offence to use threatening, abusive, or insulting words or behaviour, incitement to racial or religious hatred, or glorification of terrorism. So you can see under the kind of very broad heading of, of kind of hate speech in the UK, it's a much more kind of um, a nebulous kind of concept, a nebulous kind of entity. And then we have like this kind of like this kind of complexity and this kind of the, the kind of the, the kind of contestation which begins to emerge because on the top we have like the uh, the Human Rights Act and uh, Article 10 safeguards the right to free ex free expression, which you know isn't absolute, but you know we need to kind of protect the right for people to be able to kind of have that right of free expression, that that freedom of speech, you know, which is something which is critical in in the, in the kind of democratic space. And then we also have this notion of offence as well. You know, it's like, you know, can we be offended? Is it wrong to be offended? Do I have the right to offend somebody with what I say? And liberty there, so it says, you know, criminalising even the most unpalatable, illiberal and offensive speech should be approached with great concern. And we can see what it would mean if certain words or phrases or kind of ideas were actually owned and possessed by, you know, one community or another. The way in which sort of, you know, it becomes illegal to say a certain word or a certain phrase becomes, you know, very much a kind of thing where actually it can create tensions and so on. So try amongst all this, we have this kind of like, uh, this triangle of hate speech, free speech and kind of offence, which becomes much more kind of like sort of um, problematic and much more challenging in terms of how we kind of identify and see that clarity within that, that kind of that, that triangular kind of process. So what I wanted to do was to just give some examples, and it's been quite interesting because when, when the, um, I was invited to do this, there's been a number of kind of high profile um, kind of cases around um, which could be potential hate speech. So, so we have a couple here, and so you know, so I'm, I'm going to go. I'm going to give four examples and kind of try and understand, you know, whether or not this is hate speech or something. So we have Joe Brand, the comedian. She was on the Heresy uh, BBC program, Radio Four program, um, just a, a, over a week ago, and when she was talking about British politics and the, te the, the, ter the terrible time, um, she said that's because certain unpleasant characters are being thrown to the fore, and they're very, very easy to hate. And I'm kind of thinking, why bother with milkshake when you can get some battery acid? So this reflects the kind of the, the thing in, in, the, in the European election referent, um, uh, campaigns, where people were throwing uh, milkshakes over Nigel Farage, uh, the kind of Brexit leader, uh, Brexit right leader, but also the kind of far right figures, you know, including Tommy Robinson, uh, Stephen Yaxley, Lennon. And so what we have here is we have this kind of this tension. So is this is this a joke? Is this actually kind of incitement to hatred? Is it that you know that you know Joe Brand is actually kind of creating hate speech? and encouraging people to go out and actually throw battery acid over other, other people. Which brings us on to Nigel Farage. So Nigel Farage was one of those who actually sort of had the, uh, a milkshake thrown over him, and he <coughs> said, I am sick to death of overplay left-wing so-called comedians on the BBC who think their view is morally superior. Can you imagine a reaction if I had said the same? And, you know, there is, you know, there is, some, there is some truth in that, you know. But then, if we go back a few years to the, just prior to the Brexit referendum, and you know Nigel Farage there is standing in front of the now infamous Breaking Point um, uh, poster, which had very very little to do with the UK whatsoever. Um, we had forty thousand people lodge a complaint with the Metropolitan Police, 
alleging that that poster and Farage's use of it incited racial and religious hatred. So if we're looking at hate speech in terms of something which can be transmitted uh, you know, through the written word or through the, uh, communicated through uh, the published word, then what we can see here is that 40,000 people thought that that was a, a good example of hate speech. And then we go on to sort of another one from recent. So I think the Glastonbury Festival is this weekend, if I'm right, I'm not sure. Um, and the Glastonbury Festival organisers were um, criticised for inviting the band Children. Um, has anybody heard the band Children? Uh, I only listen to them purely because of this. Um, I'm not, you know, it's subjective, but I wouldn't recommend many people go out and listen. Um, so, uh, uh, and they were, they were, uh, they were criticised for inviting this band to, uh, to perform. And it was because they had one song which was called Kill Tori Scum, and the lyrics there, even if it's your dad or your mum, kill Tori Scum, kill Tori Scum, scum, murder them all to the beat of a drum, kill Tori Scum, kill Tori Scum. So you can see where that's kind of going. Um, the group says that it's satire, that it's, it's satirical, that there's no incitement there whatsoever, but a number of politicians and you know, a number of other people you know, have been gotten to this campaign and actually children have been removed from the, from the uh, performing at Glastonbury Festival now because they said that this was an act of, this was hate speech because it was encouraging, it would encourage listeners to go out and kill Tory scum. Um, so it's, a, you know, that they've got there. And then, of course, we get Boris Johnson, and um, almost a year to the almost a year to the day, um, in his column in the Telegraph newspaper, when he was defending the right of Muslim women to wear the niqab, so the full face veil, he also took the time to, in that same piece, to describe them as um, bank robbers and letterboxes. And this was a kind of bizarre kind of th kind of thing to say. And, and you know, I don't, you know, um, this was kind of this was called out and said that he should apologise. That this was actually inciting religious hatred towards uh, uh, Muslim women, um, and particularly to those who wear niqab. And then Rob, Rob Little in the Spectator replied by saying that um, actually Boris is wrong. Actually, there should actually be more Islamophobia in the Conservative Party than what there already is. And so again, this was criticised as saying, well, this was encouraging people to hate Muslims, this was encouraging people to, to kind of be discriminatory towards them. But are these, are these actually hate speech? You know, because my own personal view is I'm not sure any of them really are uh, an example of hate speech because, you know, do, can we see them as actually kind of, you know, inciting religious hatred? You know, the Boris Johnson thing, you know, was this about, more about kind of attracting attention? Was it about kind of, you know, you know there was some, you know, some ways in which, you know, this was a preparation for where he is now, you know, by actually kind of seeing, you know, beginning to appeal to a different type of audience. And so, you know, so what we, can, what we do know is that none of these uh, resulted in police action. There were some investigations, but none resulted in police action. So we can almost say that, that none of those were actually hate speech. And the problem we have here is because it's entirely subjective. So some of you may be thinking, well, that one was hate speech, but those other three wasn't. Some may be saying, well, all four were hate speech. And there's no kind of clear guidelines as regards where we are in terms of that. And so because of this, so what we get is we get this idea that actually hate speech becomes you know, derived from our own kind of personal and political preferences. So if we like the person, we're probably going to be a bit more forgiving towards them. So, you know, so if we like Joe Brown, we're probably going to say, oh, it's a joke. You know, if we like Boris Johnson, we're going to say, oh, you know, he, he wasn't saying anything, it was a gaffe or it was a joke or so on. And so what we find is like, that hate speech becomes entirely subjective. It becomes something where you know, we, we, there is no kind of tangible kind of line. There is no kind of categories which it can place into. You know, it becomes something which becomes in, in, entirely partial and is, is, is afforded by our own value judgments. And a lot of the time it's about who we like and who we dislike. And particularly what is being said, if it's about a group we dislike, we are probably going to be a little bit more sympathetic to what's being said than not. And then we can see this, you know, when we talk, when we talk about sort of people like kind of, you know, Tommy Robbins and Steve and the Axel Lennon, we can see that his supporters will say, well, actually, he's just telling the truth. It's not about the fact that he's inciting hatred, it's about he's telling the truth. And not only that, he becomes brave enough to be the one who's telling the truth. So again, we get this kind of thing. So are we then miscasting the issue? When we're talking about this, when we're talking about these kind of, the kind of subtleties and the different shades, are we actually miscasting the issue by trying to identify what hate speech is and what it's not? You know, or should we be looking a little bit more widely? 
So if we step back a little bit to kind of the breaking point poster, you know, on the day that that poster was actually sort of uh, launched, was also the same day that Joe Cox MP, um, the MP for Batley and Spen, was also brutally murdered um, on the street by Thomas Mayer, and who he shot and stabbed her numerous, numerous times. And Thomas Mayer was uh, said to be inspired by the extreme right wing. He had a, an obsession with Nazism. Um, he, he had made links with groups like so the English Defence League. He had made um, sort of you know, comment, you know, tried to make links with um, Tommy Robinson. A few days later, Farage claimed that when the Brexit referendum was won, um, he claimed that without a single bullet being fired, they had won the Brexit referendum. At the time, it was deemed hugely insensitive because, of course, actually, sort of one of the things was that bullets had been fired. And so this was kind of seen to be extremely insensitive in terms of that. And some said at the time, well, actually, it was this, it was this post, it was this campaign that garnered that hate, that gave kind of like permission to, in many ways to Thomas Mayer to enact that, which actually became sort of, you know, the, 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 the kind of the, 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 the foundation of it. And then more recently he said that, you know, that Farage has said, I would don car key, pick up a rifle and head for the front lines if Brexit isn't delivered. So again, we got this very violent militaristic image, you know, which is being put forward. Now, if we look at this and we kind of say, well, you know, okay, so that's not per se, hate speech. But actually what we know is that since the Brexit referendum, we have seen all hate crimes increase by 29%. So all hate crime together increased by 29%. We have seen racially and religiously motivated hate crime at record levels. So they are the highest levels they've ever been since we've re been recording them in the UK. It's also the largest overall annual increase in both racially motivated and religiously motivated hate crime. And in the 11 months following the referendum, hate crime numbers surged by 23%. So we, we know, and even the, gov the government in its own statistics, its statistical analysis has said that actually Brexit, the Brexit referendum, has catalyzed hate crime within the UK. And the uh, College of Policing have warned that actually once we do, if we do ever, kind of come out of Europe, then we should be prepared for those figures to go up again. Because this will, this will kind of embolden those people, those individuals who want to commit hate crime, to actually go and do more. So what we get there is we have hate crime, but we have this kind of speech which isn't necessarily hate speech, but we have a shade of speech where it seems to suggest that it's actually encouraged or given permission of some sort to actually enact that. If we have a look at the, if we go back to um, sort of um, uh, the Boris Johnson article, and in the, in the uh, weeks fo that followed the publication of that article, Tell Mama, uh, Mama stands for Measuring Anti-Muslim Attacks, which is a third party reporting um, uh, organization which looks at Islamophobic and anti-Muslim uh, kind of hate crimes and incidents. They said that in the weeks after this, there was a sudden upsurge of hate crimes where Muslim women who wear the, wear the bow were attacked and were referred to as bank robbers and letterboxes. They also said that prior to the fact that prior to Johnson's article, they had not recorded any incidents where that had been involved. And they also showed that they had quite a bit of significant evidence to show that this was something now that was widely used online. So again, what we have here is we have an incident or an event or something being said by someone who has power, by privilege, by a platform that actually then gets adopted and taken forward. So again, you know, saying that Muslim women look like you wear the niqab, look like a bank robber or a letterbox, I wouldn't say was actually hate crime, uh, hate speech per se. But what we have is we seem to have a shade or a subtlety of a message which is being conveyed, which then seems to embolden those people who feel that, that you know, they, they need permission to be able to go ahead and, and commit hate crime. And so what we can see here is that, I, you know, I'm not saying that you know, they are guilty of hate speech, but what we can see is that from these, we can see that violence has, has occurred. So actually, whilst these are not hate speech per se, whilst these incidents don't you know, kind of fall within any legislative or policy framework, we are in a space where actually so the things which are said, those ideas which are put forward, can actually kind of catalyze or bring about change or actually catalyze people to enact their hate that they kind of see in terms of that. And so one way in which when I talk about miscasting the issue, maybe what we're doing is when we're looking at these kind of incidents, when we're looking at is something hate speech or not, 
actually, we, that's where we're looking at it wrong, because what we have here is like uh, academics, uh, uh, Barbara Perry and Scott Pointing, they talk about you know, we need to look at the socio-political landscape and the conditions within that which enable, first off, permission to hate, but also, by consequence, permission to enact hate crime as well. And so if you have those with power, if you have those who are in the public space, if you have those who are normalising these kind of ideas, what you have is then you have this trickle down into the general public. So in order, by ordinary people in ordinary settings suddenly feel that actually this is okay because they've been given permission to do this. And they say that actually it's political figures and the kind of discourses they use, particularly those that demarcate us from them, where the other becomes oppositional, fear-inducing and threatening to us. You know, and we've seen this, you know, we can look back and we can say, well, immigrants, you know, you know, in terms of the Brexit discourse, and Muslims in terms of the kind of defence, the kind of terrorism, the kind of threat, the kind of extremist threat which is seen to pose by us, would both clearly fit into that. And so what we have now is we have this kind of culmination of two two decades where we can draw, but you know, we can we can talk, go right way back. We can talk about David Blunkett, for, for instance, talking about immigrants swarming our schools. We can talk about you know John Reed back in 2005 talking about the telltale signs of extremists sitting in front of Muslim parents in East London, saying to them, "You need to look out for the telltale signs in your five-year-old children." Now, there was never any, there's never been any telltale signs. I've never come across them, and no politician has ever been able to kind of put those to me. But what we have is we have this idea. We have these ideas being, being kind of drip-fed, which are then reinforced by those such as the English Defence League, by the Football Lads Alliance, by the Democratic Football Lads Alliance, by Britain First, by the Yellow Vests, by UKIP, by Farage, by all of these. And suddenly you have this kind of thing where actually these ideas become quite normalised, they become quite normal. And so what we get is that the, the record levels that we see in terms of hate crime are actually a reflection of the socio-political climate where those different gradations of speech, not necessarily hate speech, have actually kind of laid the foundation, they actually be, be provided the seabed from which the kind of hate crimes themselves would come. So we can see that there's a clear link between the hate crimes and the speech, not necessarily hate speech. And so, the best way to illustrate this is if, if, the, if our future, if the future Prime Minister says, well, it's okay to talk about Muslim women who wear the niqab as letterboxes, then why can't I do that? Why can't I do that when I'm online? Why can't I do that when I'm walking down the street? Why can't, why can't I say that? You know, this was kind of something which kind of come to the fore when we saw with, um, you know, with Trump, you know, when, when Trump came to, to uh, power and he talked about sort of putting the Muslim ban on. If actually your president is saying, well, actually, we don't want Muslims in this country because they're all terrorists, then why, what, you know, what, what differentiation is there between the person walking down the street and says, I don't like Muslims because you're all terrorists. You shouldn't be in this country. So what we get here is we get this idea, we get this notion of permission, we get this the, the permission that's being afforded. So this kind of drip feed, this kind of the conditions, the climate that we've been living in, the climate which has come to fruition and culmination with the Brexit referendum and since, is really where we are now, where that permission to hate has actually kind of get, has become strong. And so what we have here is we have certain forms of speech which may not necessarily be hate speech nor necessitate sense here. You know, I don't think that any of those kind of examples that we've seen there would necessitate sense here. I, I'm not talking about more censorship, I'm not talking about kind of curtailing freedom of speech or anything. But what we are doing, what we do need to realise is that in, in doing so, in that it's not just hate speech which is actually problematic. It can be these different gradations, these speech that actually demarcate people, that actually tell us that to actually be mistrusted of certain types of people, to dislike certain types of people, to actually be suspicious of those. Those things, when we get that from those political um, kind of figures, become something which encourages those conditions. And so we have there two further considerations, because you know, if we go back to that kind of triangle at the start, we have free speech, hate speech, and we have, um, um, we have um, uh, 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 offence as well, sorry, that, that completely threw me like when I saw that, I was like, I, I couldn't, uh, an, an offence. Um, and so what we have there is, is that when we hear some of the arguments about the rights of free speech, 
And as I say, I'm not advocating additional censorship. I'm not advocating that we, we, we limit what people say. But we do have to remember as well that free speech can be exploited. And I would say that you know, when we have someone standing outside a, a court, when somebody is actually being, you know, when there's, there's the, the law is in place to actually s uh, stop the reporting of that, when somebody's standing outside and saying, you know, kind of jeopardizing that trial and jeopardizing a fair trial for those people that have gone through the most hideous experiences as young girls who have been, you know, sexually abused and violently abused as well. When, somebody, when those such as Tommy Robinson say, well, this was about free speech, we have to push back on that and say this wasn't about free speech. This is about you breaking the law. Then no one was saying you can't, you know, you can't say certain ideas or things. You can't criticise Muslims. But what he was doing at that time was against, you know, was against the law. And so we have to be very careful about those who are seeking to exploit that kind of notion of free speech. The other as well is that you know there's a hypocrisy here. And if we go back to that point I was making, it's about who we like and who we don't like. We can't defend, you know, just the people that we like. We have to try and find a way to actually be fair in it. And I'm saying that, you know, that, that Farage was saying what he likes and says, well, you know, I'm telling the truth, I'm saying this, you know, there's someone needs to stand up against these political elites who have been lying to you for so long. But actually, when somebody says something he doesn't like, he's immediately the first one that says, oh, actually, that's hate speech. They yeah, should be censored, they shouldn't be able to say that. So we have to have some sort of, you know, we have to make sure that we're not hypocritical in that. And that's challenging for all of us, because if we are talking about this kind of idea, you know, where, where we create a space where we understand the challenges and we understand the different gradations, but we also want to uphold freedom of speech, that becomes extremely problematic for us. So in conclusion, I've got, I've got four needs as a way of kind of move forward. So a need to better understand the complexity of the relationship and overlap between hate speech offence and kind of free speech. And I I'm not necessarily advocating that we need more legislation or censure in terms of that, but I think we do need to have a better understanding. We need to be able to talk about the nuance and the complexity of that. We also need to make sure that we balance the protection of free speech with the protection of those who are being targeted by those using hateful speech. And I think that, that we should always look to those that are being targeted, those who are becoming the victims of hate speech, or whatever speech or whatever gradation, we should always bear those in mind first. That should be our priority in terms of that. And there's also a need to acknowledge that some forms of speech have greater potential to encourage and foment hate and division than others. I per personally don't think that a band that's going to be on the stage on the, in the middle of nowhere in Glastonbury Festival who plays one song that probably 20 people are going to listen to has the same kind of potential impact as those, say, as Nigel Farage or um, uh, Boris Johnson. And I think that we need to kind of understand that and we need to, you know, to have some sort of balance in terms of that. And finally, I think there's a very real need for us to challenge and counter those who use those positions of privilege and influence to drip feed those hateful messages. And I'm not sure that may, we have done that effectively today. So thanks very much and, uh, and thanks so much for your time. Thanks. Um, I'd like to thank both Naoto and Chris for um, actually a very inspirational uh, uh, set of presentations that are, that are both uh, different but complementary. And again, when we think about the framing of uh, the UK and Japan, I'm struck by the similarities between the two countries. Island countries, em the history of empire, then post-empire, uh, spoke about the relationship between Japan and Korea and Korean immigrants. Of course, in the UK, immigration goes back many, many hundreds of years. But in the post-war period, colonial immigration uh, from the Caribbean and the Indian subcontinent in particular, uh, and then uh, immigration going through cycles to, to Europe and then uh, global immigration more recently. Uh, recovery and recession. Uh, and the impact are around uh, economic and social uh, change in both countries. And then when you think about hate speech, in hate speech, uh, you could, one could argue that if the hate speech legislation is very embryonic, mm -hmm. whereas in the UK it's much more established mm -hmm. and embedded within uh, not-for-profit not organizations as well as uh, local governments. And I think both 
uh, Chris and Erica spoke about this sense of post-colonial melancholy, and you spoke about Paul Gilroy's work uh, on that very uh, powerfully as well. So the framing, there's lots of similarities between the two countries that perhaps in terms of your presentations allows us to get into uh, the discussion. Now, uh, we've got 15 minutes as a panel, and I, I've, I've got some uh, points and questions for both of you uh, before we go out to uh, uh, colleagues uh, in the room. The first point in t is in terms of regulating hate speech, um, uh, positive against the freedom of uh, speech uh, that is embedded in many countries uh, around the world. Now, regulating hate speech is, is, is very challenging. So where's the, where's the line between regulation mm -hmm. of hate speech, which may cause an offence to communities? And I think, Chris, you spoke about this uh, in your presentation in terms of the freedom of speech. So when does it topple over? Where is the line uh, drawn? Noted. In the case of Japan? In the case of Japan. Uh, the basic difference between the UK and Japan is that Japanese literature is a great influence by that, that of the US, which, uh, which uh, place high value on the freedom of speech. So the ruling LDP has been consistently reluctant to any regression. This is why the this is why uh, the even the opposition just to prepare for uh, what can say uh, uh, anti discrimination law which levies no punishment or no ban to such kind of uh, yes uh, hate speeches or hate violence. Chris. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, as 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 I you know said in the in, in the presentation, it, it, it's very, it's very very difficult and it's very very complex. And I think that the, I think there's two things that we there's, there's two approaches we could use we could do um, to try and kind of um, uh, narrow that complexity. I think the first would be to have basic guidance in the same way we have with hate crime but also with hate speech as well so not necessarily that that would that would be um, uh, that would criminalize certain types of language but we would actually have be able to judge when something is hate speech so what does hate speech hate speech do does it incite hatred does it actually create you know discrimination does it actually marginalize or something you know so and I'm not saying that all of those would be in that in that guidance, but I think that if we had something which was a little bit more firmer, something which was a little bit more clear, that would give us something that we can work with in terms of that. The, the second part would be to, to kind of utilise something along the lines of the Equalities and Human Rights Commission. So I, I'm, not, I'm not sure if everyone knows what that is. So it, it doesn't seem to be in the news too much now. Uh, but it, it's the, um, so we used to have the Race, Race Relations uh, Commission, the Equal Opportunities Commission, and that became the Equality and Human Rights Commission in 2006. And this is a, a, a government, uh, a, a basic independent watchdog, which is funded by, the, by the, the, the British state, which looks at issues around discrimination in terms of employment, education, delivery of goods, you know, public services and so on. And I, I wonder whether there's something there that we could have. So rather than going down this route of criminalisation, where actually, sort of, you know, and on the most extreme form, then we would need that criminalisation because, it, you know, the, the, that, and that's where they're in the statutes. But actually something around the kind of Equality and Human Rights Commission, that actually could do something on an annual basis where it could produce a report which gives us some of the insights into these different gradations and maybe look at some of the consequences without doing it in too much of a judgmental way, but actually in a way that we kind of better understand those, those situations. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I think that's really sort of interesting in, in, in terms of the complexity that you spoke about, Chris, uh, around this subject area, because something that seems very simplistic is actually has a number of nuances. And, the second, my second point actually uh, touches on something that you both said when you spoke about uh, the rise of far-right po uh, politics. Of course, far-right politics has now got a very different label to it, and it's called populism, uh, and common sense populism that is taken root and actually been very, very successful uh, in different parts of the world. We talk about the United States as a classic example, 
uh, with the rise of Trump and his uh, the shock election victory over Hillary Clinton on the basis of language that you yeah, remarked, Chris, that uh, became normalized when only a few years ago it would have seemed to be abnormal for a politician to uh, uh, speak in that way. And of course, uh, in the UK, uh, the result of Brexit in 2016 uh, could also be seen as a manifestation of populism. We've seen in, in Europe, in Germany, in Scandinavia, which is often seen as the poster child for welfare capitalism uh, and the welfare state, uh, but the fastest rising party there are uh, the Swedish uh, Democrat Party, who uh, were previously seen as a, a prescribed neo-Nazi uh, organization. Now, my point is, is that given the electoral success of the far right and populists all over the world, uh, do you think the battle has been lost? Is, do you think that it's something that beholds on us as many of us in this room who regard, us, regard ourselves as progressives uh, and embedded into democratic structures? Is, is, is it the fact that we're wrong rather than the people who are the populists who are wrong? So have they got it right and we as uh, people wedded to uh, a much more liberal philosophy, uh, are we the ones not talking the language uh, of people like Farage. Actually, Farage and um, people in Japan, perhaps they're the ones who have got it right. Perhaps they've got the pulse, the finger on their pulse. Perhaps we're wrong. Do That's a bit of a devil's advocate question. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Um, so, so I, 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 I I was at Birmingham City University um, a couple of years ago. Uh, I came to see uh, John Denham. John Denham's the um, uh, former Labour minister uh, under Tony Blair, and he's now the uh, professor of Englishness studies um, at the University of Winchester. Uh, uh, I don't want to say I just not being recorded, but I feel as though he was shoehorned into that. Um, you know, so uh, <laughs> you know. Um, but um, uh, but he made a really interesting point because he said that he made this point that actually, why is it that so many people from the, the kind of working class, the kind of core Labour left-wing vote moved to the far right, and he said that actually one of the things was was that the left in itself kind of you know became very inward-looking. It became very much a kind of middle-class kind of um, dominated movement, and that if anybody from the kind of the, the, the kind of more working-class fringe asked difficult questions, it was almost dismissed out of hand. It was like, oh, you're racist. You can't have this. You know, immigration's good. You know, so on and so on and so on. And so, you know, so we spoke about some of these things. So, so I think that that I think that that is I think that there is some evidence of that, and I and I, I think that, that that is the case as well. I think that in some ways the left has not been able to find a kind of a, a way in which to communicate in a kind of populist and accessible way about that. You know, that why. You know, equality is a good thing. Why immigration is a good thing. Why Britain's diversity is a good thing. I don't think these arguments have been put forward. I think at the same time as well, what we've done is we, you know, there's a, there's a kind of consciousness that that the far right are still skinheads. They still look like that this is England. You know, kind of 1982, 1984. They're all walking around with Dr. Martin boots, skinhead haircuts, check shirts, braces, and actually. The far right isn't that anymore. You know, we can look back to, to you know, uh, Nick Griffin around 1999 in the British National Party, talking about making themselves look more presentable, look more acceptable, wearing suits. In, the, in you know, uh, myself and, and Harris are, are based in, in Birmingham, I'm at the University of Leicester. Most of my research is in Birmingham. If you go to the outskirts of Birmingham, you find the black country, which is like got high levels of deprivation, post-industrialization. You saw the British National Party there make very quick inroads because what they did was they were the ones who were prepared to go into those areas where the mainstream parties didn't want to anymore. And they went there, they weren't boot boys, they were like dressed in suits, they presented themselves as proper politicians, and they made inroads into the local government. And what we've failed to get is the way in which the far right has diversified and had just how dynamic it really is. And so I've just been commissioned to do some research on National Action, which was the first far-right group um, which was prescribed in the UK. This is a group that was planning for white jihad. They were planning for it to establish a white homeland. They were prepared to enact murder. But then we have the far-right as well. We have those individuals that, that Harris mentioned, you know, who go into mosques in Christchurch, who has no links with far-right groups whatsoever. He's online, yes, he's in the dark web. Yes, he's got people agreeing with him and so on. But actually, they're not a part of a, a fixed group. And then we have the EDL, or Britain First, marching down the street, carrying crosses, which is not appealing to, to anybody else. 
And then we have generational identity who's going on to universities and appealing to the middle class, you know, kind of intelligent, you know, young person who wouldn't be attracted to, to go, wouldn't, wouldn't want to go and march with Britain First or EDL. And so we've failed in that respect. I think we've failed in terms of the language, and I think we've failed to recognise that how quickly and rapidly the right has changed. I think, that's a, I think that's a really good point, because one of the things that the British National Party back in the day used to say, one of their uh, electioneering slogans was, vote for us, the British National Party, we're the Labour Party that your parents and grandparents used to vote for. And the disconnect between uh, the mainstream left and its core constituency has been very important. I've got one final question before uh, we have to throw it out uh, to the audience. In terms of going back to my point, is that we've gathered today to talk about hate speech uh, as something that's emerged uh, suddenly uh, and has galvanized us and we must do something about it. But my question to both of you, press uh, now to start with you, is to say, well, actually, when you think about the UK, and you go back to Hansard, the parliamentary uh, narrative that is done on parliamentary debates, go back 150 years to Irish migration in the 1850s, and then 100 plus years to Jewish migration from Eastern Europe, and post-war migration from 1945, the debates are very similar. There's hateful speech that is being developed uh, and narrated by politicians and the media outside. Uh, so, is this about is this more about continuity and the fact that people are reporting it more because there's more outlets such as social media, or so is it being embedded in the psyche of Japan mm. and it's now coming out, or has it all uh, is it something new? When uh, hate speech began was in 2013, uh, a book was has become not bestseller but we are well sold. Uh, the title is uh, uh, that, that deal with uh, the massacre of Koreans uh, during the Kanto earthquake in two, uh, 1980. Because uh, about 6,000 6, Koreans were killed during the earthquake because uh, they were, what they say, uh, planning conspiracy to uh, throw toxic, toxic in the well, and many, many Japanese uh, organized, uh, many Japanese organized to kill Koreans, mm -hmm. and which are regarded as a continuity of hate speech or uh, hate against Koreans. Very yeah, yeah, sure. I, I think that I think that I think it's almost kind of cyclical, and I, and I feel that I feel that I've always gone back to where I was as a child, and uh, you know I, I remember my grandparents and some of the things my grandparents would say it would absolutely jar me. You know, like I'd be like, oh, really? You know, are you, are you really saying that? And then, you know, it's kind of within those kind of circles that these things were kind of sometimes acceptable, sometimes not. And I think that there's that kind of extreme that, that's kind of, I feel as though we're kind of back in, back into it. And, and social media in particular seems to have, you know, cultivated that seabed where these things can be shared and so on. But I think the key thing here is the way in which it's become much more acceptable again. I think that we had a time where if people said certain things, if people inferred certain things, there would be a time when there would be a, maybe a collective or a public outrage that this was being said. I'm not sure that we're in that space anymore. And I think that actually, if even if the most shocking things were said about certain groups, I still think there's some groups where there's a kind of hierarchy. You can say certain things about this group, but maybe not this group. But I think that what, what we find is that this group is the group that's being said about now. And once we start attacking that and we accept that, well, actually, it then filters down as well. And so, you know, so those groups that are not in the kind of, uh, in the, 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 the kind of spotlight at the moment, you know, it's not to say they won't be, I think it will be. So. Okay. Thanks very much, both of you. So that's the uh, end of my speech.